Good afternoon. This is Derek Olson, the president of World Oregon. Thank you again for joining us for, as I was mentioning, our second virtual program. Today's program is on COVID-19 and the future of democracy in Europe. And our presenter is the distinguished professor from Portland State University, Yuri Salada, who has um, presented for us many times. He is a professor of political science, international studies, holds an endowed chair in contemporary Turkish studies, and the director of the Center for Turkish Studies, as well as the Mark Hatfield School of Government. He teaches courses on the European Union, international political economy, decision-making, and Turkish politics. His most recent research projects include the World Values Study, uh, Power Transition Theory, the Rise of Islamicism in Turkey, and EU-Turkey Relations. He's been a consultant to various policy think tanks, and agencies of the US government and participate in the task force that wrote the constitution of Afghanistan by invitation to the White House back in 2003. He's a regular speaker for us. It's an honor to have him speaking on this prescient topic. And I am going to, Bureau, um, unmute you, ask you to start your video and hand it over to you for the presentation. After uh, our speaker is done with his presentation, uh, our director of programs, Tim DeRoche, will come back online uh, to ask questions that you are presenting through the chat room. So you can ask questions along the way. Tim is monitoring the chat. Um, or if you have a problem with uh, the Zoom, uh, we'll do our best to help troubleshoot that. So without further ado, our guest of honor, thank you very much. Thank you, Derek and Tim for inviting me to talk about uh, Europe and the current crisis we're facing worldwide and the various uh, threats to democracy uh, that could be compounded by the current COVID-19 challenges. Um, European Union is one of my favorite subjects. I have been studying and researching it for since 1980s. Um, and in our last book, Global Power Transition and um, the Future of European Union, we identified four major challenges for the future of the European Union. Um, fiscal Union, Brexit, Common Foreign Security Policy, and Immigration. Now COVID-19 is adding more to these challenges uh, all through different perspectives you can imagine and the rise of populism and the opportunist authoritarian regimes. There is no doubt that there is a cor correlation between rise of populism around the world and the last financial crisis world economies faced in 2008. Subsequent to the financial crisis, we saw uh, throughout the world, in many countries, uh, elections that surprised the observers uh, with the rise of radical right-wing and sometimes left-wing political parties championing populist uh, policies. In fact, if you look at the indices such as Polity4 or Freedom House or uh, Economist Intelligence Unit, which track yearly the rise and, and decline of democracy around the world, we have seen so a fluctuation in many places and some democracies that were quite promising have literally turned around and become very authoritarian. One of the countries that I follow uh, closely, uh, Turkey has in, 12, uh, in a matter of 12 years, went from a, a model uh, multi-party parliamentarian democracy, albeit it had its weaknesses, but it had been a, a fairly stable one, um, and since becoming a candidate for European Union membership had undertaken major democratic reforms. Uh, instead, in the last 12, 15 years, turned its back on democracy and become quite authoritarian. Though, if you look at the indices, it uh, lists Turkey as a hybrid regime. Uh, I would go even further than that. 
and say that it has become more authoritarian than a simple hybrid regime. Uh, the same is also true in several other European countries. And the map you are seeing shows in colors the index of democracy in Europe. Um, one could also say that there are tendencies in our own country here in the United States where uh, some political forces would like to use the current COVID crisis for further strengthen um, control of civil liberties by the state. By that, I mean by the federal government. Uh, in the European Union, the Central and Eastern European countries, as you know, emerged out of communism in the early 1990s, looking west. And at the time, even though they were not quite um, uh, capable of joining the European Union and lacked pretty much all the necessary conditions for membership, the European Union countries, uh, the existing members thought it would be to everybody's advantage to lock them in with membership promises through agreements such as the Europe uh, treaties to prepare them for transition to democracy, market economy, and eventually to join the European Union. And they did, uh, most of them did at the time, uh, in 2004. Uh, one weakness in this entire process of membership of new countries is the, the, in, the lack of presence of democratic reforms um, that the European Union would oversee to make sure countries coming in with me would meet uh, democracy uh, requirements. That's called the political acquis uh, in the European Union. The, in, what I mean by that is there is a lot more emphasis given to institutional development of demo democratic means at the same time, economic development to prepare these economies for challenges from the uh, established capitalist economies of the European Union. But on the other hand, when it comes to values, attitudes, and beliefs, hardly anything was there and still is lacking to prepare these societies for what it means to have a liberal democracy, a representative democracy. And Currently, we're seeing examples of backlash in that regard. Uh, those of us who have spent a lifetime studying European Union, the integration process has, have identified this as one of the major shortcomings of the membership process in the European Union. Uh, the European Union right now is what I would call is a two-track membership or a union. One is the Eurozone countries, and the other is uh, countries that are not in the Eurozone, that's the single currency, but have linked their uh, currencies to Europe, um, with the exception of uh, Sweden, and um, trying to coordinate their monetary and fiscal policies vis-a-vis -vis the Eurozone. There is one other important aspect of this, and that is the Schengen Agreement. The Schengen Agreement is um, freedom of movement within the European Union and countries that have signed the Schengen uh, Treaty uh, and there are 26 of them, and, and some of these are not within the EU, but are closely linked to the European Union, like Switzerland, Norway, Liechtenstein. Uh, and if you have a Schengen visa, let's say an American uh, visiting Europe, if you get a Schengen visa, you can freely travel across these countries beyond the 90 day limit for regular tourists. Um, even though there is uh, freedom of movement within the EU, you can imagine 
external borders of every country to outside world. Uh, it's sort of funny thing to keep in mind. Um, so non-EU citizens, once they go to EU, if they simply have a visa from one EU country, it's not automatically guaranteed for them to travel to other countries unless they have a Schengen visa. Uh, so keep that in mind. What happened in the European Union was a rise in populism along with rise in right-wing uh, political parties emphasizing nationalism. And this uh, has been creeping up in Europe over the last 20 some years, but really picked up after the financial crisis of 2008. And European Union did not emerge out of that deep recession until a few years ago, much, much later than the United States recovered. And the reason for that was there is no fiscal union in the EU. Even though we call it a EU, it's not a country. It's a very interesting international organization. It's a regional international organization, intergovernmental organization that has state-like aspirations. Each country is sovereign. Each country has its own national interests, but through EU institutions, they try to coordinate. So you can imagine if we didn't have a treasury department in the United States, and if we didn't have a fiscal union with a huge federal budget, what would have happened to 50 states after the 2000 financial crisis? Lender of last resort, so to speak. In the European Union, they struggle and fought with each other, trying to save southern countries with uh, the austerity measures pushed by the northern countries. And instead of moving forward, taking this opportunity of crisis to move further down the road with a fiscal union, they simply put into place stop gap measures with some financial backing to help each other overcome uh, any future crisis. It doesn't take too much for a union like this to collapse with another serious financial crisis. And if that financial crisis is coupled with rising tensions brought about by populism, which emphasizes nationalist interests, and then the divide, income divide between the rich and the poor regions of the European Union, you can imagine a situation where not only individual countries may start violating the common policies of the European Union, but within each country, there may be regions asking for more and more autonomy or independence. Uh, about a month or so ago, I saw a map of Europe on, I think it was on Facebook. You may Google and see if you can find it. And it was a, a very interesting map with different colors and very small regions you know, with colors coding and so forth that looked like something out of early 1700s. And I said, well, that's a very interesting historical map. And the closer I looked at it and I went to the source, no, it was not the historical month, but map, but the current one where the author has identified all the regions in Europe that were asking for more autonomy or independence from the central state, like Catalonia in Spain or the Basque region and, and so forth. That is a very interesting development and a dangerous one because it goes against the deepening of regional integration in Europe. And we have some examples of even uh, more challenging uh, issues with Brexit. Uh, we predicted in our study two years ago that it will be a hard Brexit. And now we need to start thinking about what about post-Brexit union of United Kingdom? Will Scotland push for independence? 
Wales push for independence? What is going to happen for the uh, United Kingdom in years to come? Um, uh, just like Brexit, there are other e regions in, in Europe and within the EU. Catalonia is very much uh, divided in this issue. The Basque are divided in this uh, and push. The Italians are showing signs of um, a conflict between their northern and southern uh, provinces. And now we are also seeing that, uh, for example, Hungary has been very adamant about violating common European policies, uh, starting with the immigration and now um, using the coronavirus threat as an opportunity to dismantle democracy. Democracy is one of the found foundations, major pillar of the European Union. Unless a country meets the uh, basic requirements of liberal representative democracy, it cannot join the EU. Hungary developed democratic institutions. In fact, in fact, uh, Orban, Viktor Orban was pushing for that in the early 1990s and now he's dismantling it. The recent bill that passed through the Hungarian parliament on March 30th gives Viktor Orban extraordinary powers to govern by decree for indefinite period. What does that mean? That means sidelining the parliament. So the cabinet can pass a decision by decree and it's law. It's amazing. Uh, 13 EU countries, interestingly, not 26. There are currently 27 countries in the EU. Um, so take out Hungary, 13 of them signed a a letter condemning this, that emergency measures should be limited to what is strictly necessary, should be proportionate and temporary in nature, subject to regular scrutiny and respect the uh, principles of international law and obligations of EU member states. And furthermore, such measures should not restrict the freedom of expression or the freedom of the press. Unfortunately, the new law that gives uh, Viktor Orban unlimited powers flies in the face of that. Um, it basically um, makes it, for example, punishable by one to five years in prison for anybody who may spread false facts, define what is false is defined by the government or distorted any way that would impede the effectiveness of defense measures against COVID-19. So hypothetically, if you were to put something on Facebook or your Twitter account outlining uh, the facts about coronavirus in, let's say in Budapest, that the government is somehow hiding or wouldn't want you to know the real figures, you would probably uh, face uh, the power of the state. Uh, th this is a very interesting development and we have seen uh, further uh, calls for radical emergency measures by right-wing political parties in Italy, in uh, France, in Spain, in Greece, even though in Greece they lost the uh, elections and are not in power, but they are stirring up trouble. Um, and countries have been looking inward for national interest in the face of these, the current uh, crisis rather than looking for uh, collective 
uh, response. Uh, today, Italian government is facing uh, serious criticism for signing the agreement yesterday for financial uh, support that will be coordinated by the European Union institutions. Uh, half a billion euros signed uh, as emergency measures for countries to uh, tap into. But Italians and the Spaniards are saying, what took you so long? And we don't uh, appreciate your slowness in responding to this, this common crisis. And they feel ignored. Uh, they wanted to push for, and they had some support from France, for creation of Corona bonds, a, a collective uh, effort of creating an EU bond, something very new, that could be used to finance the uh, needs of the member states during this crisis. Uh, both Germany and the Netherlands oppose that. And it also looks like if anything like that to be put into motion, the bureaucracy and the process of creating a new institution of such would take anywhere from one to three years. So again, we're facing a short-term approach. Um, the, the Dutch and the Germans are uh, insisting of tough, economic conditions for borrowing from the, the new uh, uh, fund under the European Stability Mechanism. Uh, and we'll see what's, how this is going to uh, play out. They're not out of the woods economically. Uh, I believe that European Union is going to suffer far worse than the United States because of lack of the uh, collective institutional um, institutions and the institutional policies uh, that can be found under a true fiscal union. They just don't have it. So we are facing very serious problems. I want to add to this the income gap that is fueling the rise of authoritarian uh, regimes and political parties uh, that give their leaders this opportunity to combine uh, the income gap with the current economic crisis and health crisis and would, might lead to furthering their ambitions of eroding democracy in Europe. And that is, uh, I think everybody's quite aware that income gap uh, in the world has gone uh, sideways. Uh, since 1980, there has been a tremendous jump in the income distribution um, in, in, in these countries and in the United States as well. Uh, for that, if you look at, uh, let's say, the, the distribution of national income uh, and what percentage of national income is held by the top 1% of uh, income groups. It has gone, for example, in uh, Germany from roughly 10% to 16, 17%. In France, it's less, but um, in Let's in, in the United States, it's jumped from about, oh, I'm looking at my graph, 8% to 18, 20% and showing no decline. Uh, in Europe, you can actually do a quick calculations uh, on north-south divide of income distribution and see the discrepancies uh, between countries as well as within countries. Um, so it adds to the uh, complaints of uh, citizens uh, that the economic model pushed by the uh, EU, uh, major European Union countries and European Central Bank, uh, IMF, have worked against the interest of uh, ordinary workers. Um, and 
to add to that, the social welfare state in Europe has been facing more and more cost and because of that cuts in, in recent years, in the last couple of decades, as populations are aging far faster than in North America. And it also explains one of the reasons why so many more people are uh, actually dying from COVID-19 in Italy uh, and Spain than other uh, parts of the of world. So this is a very challenging times and we need to be very aware of the dangers of opportunist right wing and to some extent some left wing populist uh, political parties that have hidden agendas of undermining democracy uh, with the um, propaganda, if you will, of promoting democracy. They would come out and say something, but hold something very hidden. That's exactly what happened in Turkey. Uh, and it's happened in Russia. Uh, it's, it's happening in Poland. Um, it's very frightening um, that these countries are showing decline in democracy. So there's some some glimmer of hope that when we look at Slovenia, Slovakia, and Czechia, the old Czech Republic, we see some improvements there. Um, and Romania has shown improvements, uh, but they're very fragile, if you will. Okay, so it, it's going to be a very challenging times ahead. Uh, we expect the economies of the European Union to uh, collapse to, but anyway, well, this quarter, quite a bit, um, six to 10% decline uh, in production. Um, and we just don't know. It's going to be a, a deep recession for them again. And that, like I said, they barely came out of recession that started in 2008. And if 2008 had caused a serious backlash um, towards the existing uh, political systems, the democratic systems and the, uh, the, the traditional political parties, you can imagine the uh, threat the current crisis pose for the next round of elections. Uh, one last thing I want to mention is that we just finished the World Value Survey uh, wave seven in, in January of this year globally. And in June, we will have data sets available to look at. And I'm, I am personally very curious to see how far we have seen changes between rise of populism and the worsening economic conditions uh, in these countries and individuals' perception of their financial well-being. Uh, in the previous index uh, uh, wave uh, in, in 2011, we saw that there was a, a relationship. So if this has continued, that will signal to us that we got major challenges ahead of us. So with that, I think I would stop and see if we have any questions. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you, Bureau. This is uh, Tim DeRoche, Director of Programs for mm -hmm. World of Oregon. I see some, some uh, questions beginning to come in. Uh, I'd like to ask the first one because I can. And um, so Orban has been a guest at the White House. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned the 13 countries of the EU condemning this. Has there been any word from the State Department on our end around um, this um, flying in the face against democracy? I've seen none. Uh, the bill passed on, on the 30th of last month, and I have seen nothing, nothing from Washington uh, condemning that. 
uh, incidentally, the 13 countries, if uh, listeners are interested, are Belgium, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Greece, Ireland, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Portugal, Spain, and Sweden. So all, all Western Europe. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. So we've got a question from Karen Godden. Thank you, Karen. Can Russia be anything other than a troublemaker in the situation as opposed to expanding like Belarus is evidently considering? And can you speak to the situation in Ukraine? Uh, well, Belarus is it's the most authoritarian country in Europe. Uh, Europe, we have to, dis sometimes we get it confused, EU and Europe. Europe, Council of Europe has 51 member states. European Union has 27. It used to be 28. Brexit took care of that. Um, yes, the president of Belarus, Lukashenko, dismisses coronavirus as a psychosis. And he has advocated that Belarusians should simply drink vodka and go to saunas for remedy. I'm not joking. This is exactly what he has been saying. And there is a union between Belarus, Belarusia, and uh, Russia. Russia, under Putin, has been engaged for quite some time. This isn't new. And this hasn't started with the last presidential elections in the United States to undermine the transatlantic alliance ever since NATO expanded to include Central and Eastern European countries that joined the EU. An interesting fact that most people overlook is, is this. Enlargement, Eastern enlargement of the European Union occurred simultaneously with enlargement of NATO. And the Russians have always seen this as a threat under Putin. And two countries fall in the, in the buffer zone, if you will. One is Ukraine, which is not a NATO country. But the other one is Turkey, which is a NATO country. Russia, for the last 20 years, has been doing everything it can to destabilize the region and damage NATO. Direct challenge has been in Ukraine with the pro-Russian side, the, the nationalist side that is looking <clears throat> west. Um, and we have also seen, though it's a small example of similar engagement first through uh, cyber attacks and dismantling of the uh, cyber infrastructure of Georgia, then Ukraine, and with Turkey getting close to the, the then rising uh, leader Erdogan who look like uh, uh, some kind of a, a liberal, moderate Islamist. But I would have, instead, I was one of the people saying he's a wolf in sheep's clothing to destabilize NATO. So this is a, a long-term policy of Russia. Instead of directly challenging NATO on the ground, using other means to destabilize Western democracies from within. At the same time, if you can distance Turkey from Europe, and they've done this very well, uh, then you have undermined NATO's capabilities. 
because uh, that is a very important country in NATO. What it used to be an ally with a capital A is now an ally in name only. That's a huge change in a matter of 25 years. Um, with Ukraine, it was an opportunity for uh, Putin to make sure that country does not move further into European uh, sphere, the EU, I mean. And I also blame here the European Union for ignoring both Ukraine and Turkey early on because of internal short-sighted political priorities of the then leaders in the 1990s. Had they locked in Ukraine and Turkey into European Union, we wouldn't be facing these sort of problems right now. So <clears throat> to circle around, we've got a great question from Amelia Bellows that kind of takes this into a different place. How do you see neo-colonialist and neo-imperialist efforts growing or evolving as wealthy EU nations face mm -hmm. populism and major economic struggle? Well, internal colonialism in the European Union is very much a reality. And that is expansion of Western European uh, countries and their economies and their corporations, whatnot, into the other regions. Uh, one of my colleagues has written about this uh, in the 90s during the um, when EU was getting ready to absorb Central and Eastern European countries. Um, the, well, there is one issue here. All of these countries have shown interest in joining the EU. You have to apply. EU doesn't come to you and say, why don't you come and join us? Um, you have to apply and you have to then adopt the EU policies and so forth. And eventually what that means is you're gonna change. And those changes are not easy and they could be problematic and they could cause a lot of internal tensions. Uh, we still have tensions within Italy, between North and South. And ever since Brussels got in the game, the Southern Italians have been feeling pretty much beaten up uh, when uh, te technocrats from Brussels starts telling them how to make cheese or whatnot. Uh, well, wait a minute, what do you know about you know, cheese making in Sicily, for example? Um, I'm using that as a real example. Or when they try to change the work hours in the Mediterranean region, that doesn't work in the summer. Um, and, and the corporations have been taking over the European Union, it has always been driven by economic interests. In fact, the very origin of the European community is based on that. To integrate the economies of France and Germany to such an extent that, that war between them would not only be unthinkable, but it would be economically impossible. That was the driving factor. And the reason uh, they changed the Rome Treaty in the early 1980s to make, to open the road to a common market that was stuck basically, was a major business leader's effort of, uh, and it was, in fact, it was led by the then chairman of Fiat, uh, again, as this happens and you start looking for more and more expanded markets for the operations to be more uh, competitive, what happens to mom and pop shops? What happens to small industries? Uh, they can't compete um, and they start disappearing. In Central and Eastern Europe, we're seeing this happen every day. Uh, first, you had fire sale of state-owned enterprises to those capable of buying them if they wanted to buy them. Uh, and that privatization, which is part of the neoliberal economic model, it's been pushed on 
almost every country in the world by IMF uh, is also an internal policy efforts in, in the European Union. Uh, what does privatization mean? It simply means taking part of the state owned enterprises and turning them over to private hands. Well, if it is state owned, that means it's owned by all the citizens, residents of that country. By selling it at fire sale and giving it to those capable of buying it, you're transferring national wealth. That's the hidden factor behind privatization. I don't know of any economic theory in the world that says an enterprise has to be privately owned to be profitable. It's an issue of management. There have been many and still are state owned enterprises within Europe that are quite profitable. So yes, you do have this issue of neo-colonialism, if you want to call that, that is part of the economic model that, in my opinion, this economic model that's been pushed on the world since 1980 has uh, not fared well in terms of uh, meeting the needs of the average Joe. Well, so to that point, do you see a day where we move beyond the, the sort of mercantilist approach to a multilateralism that is more grounded in values and um, sort of the recognizing the intercultural aspects of the union? Because I think the thing that is missing in a lot of the reporting is we're seeing how each one of these countries is being challenged by uh, COVID-19, but if we are still in a space of open border and people moving, um, how, does the, how do you see the, um, the multilateralism moving beyond the pure economic? Um, there is a change in Europe. There is a change in identity. And that's what I wanna keep my eyes on uh, with the next round of survey data. I want to see to what extent, if there is any change in younger generations' perception of who they are. There is a generational gap in Europe. The older Europeans identify more with the nation state than Europe, than younger people. Um, but we need to also be careful about not over generalizing this because there are significant differences between some of the Eastern European countries and Western European countries, the old guard and the, and, and the newer members. Uh, so a uh, higher proportion of younger people in the West have been identifying themselves first as European and national second. However, if European Union continues to kick the can down the road without addressing these major economic challenges, I do not see any way they can complete the union. They will have to revert back, and that would be revert back to an, uh, a lesser integrated level of institutional integration. We have stages of this. They are right now at economic union and some are in economic and monetary union. Next one is political union. They don't have that. They only have some inter-related uh, intergovernmental arrangements. There's no fiscal union in the EU. One that is below this is the common market, the original goal of the European community, which Britain simply wanted and nothing more. And I'm not surprised that they're out. Um, they didn't feel comfortable with going further and further down the road of economic integration. But it's a catch-22, Tim. Uh, it, to go further down the road of integration means further surrender of sovereignty to Brussels, to EU. And that is not easy thing to do, particularly given the fact that this entity didn't emerge as a union. 
unlike the United States. Uh, and there's still cultural differences, values differences. There's still nationalistic elements. One of the most intergovernmental aspects of the EU is foreign and security policy. God forbid if there was a war on the eastern borders of the European Union against Russia, who's going to be supporting what? I don't know what Orban would do or Poland. They're looking more and more towards Russia. Would they be willing to uh, pull together with the rest of the EU countries to uh, go against Russian interests? Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a mixed thing. To revert back to a common market means dismantling the single currency. Well, that's going to be a hefty cost. So they're caught there. And it, it's, un, it's unlikely that they would be able to make any move in either direction. So um, I would add to your, you talked about the cultural and the economic. Mm -hmm. I would throw into that the generational, because certainly the generational mm -hmm. divide um, was, a big, was a big issue around Brexit. Uh, I think that there is a, you know, clearly people I've talked to felt that economic opportunity was being wrenched away from them in terms of, you know, the freedom to travel. And, um, but I think on top of this, you know, we're seeing a lot of the shockwaves of reactions to uh, the, the migrant crisis. So what role do you think the otherization, xenophobia, and certainly racism is playing in the economic and political conversations that are happening right now in the EU? I think those, that issue is the most connected one to COVID-19 uh, because you're using another issue to glue onto the fear of the other. Uh, what I mean by that is the immigration policy, lack thereof, um, opposing refugees, asylum seekers, um, and now say, well, here's another reason why we should be more protective of ourselves and close our doors because they may be bringing in COVID-19. So it's a very easy thing to do uh, by those governments that are already against immigration and refugees. Uh, so yes, it makes it even harder for the EU to have a common policy in that regard. Xenophobia is live and well in the EU. And there are so many unreported cases in the US media of hate crimes in European Union that if you really uh, wanted to know and get depressed, uh, look at some of the local news in, in Europe. It's just frightening. So, Birol, to that, to that regard, if, if people out there who are participating today want to stay abreast of EU reporting that we may not see in a lot of our, you know, our sort of, mm -hmm. our, our regular media, the, the Times, the Post, whatever, where would you rec recommend they go? I would say... Uh, there are some watchdogs that you can, you, there is, um, what is it called? It's a uh, Euroactive um, source. It, you, if you did that, Euro, Euroactive and you, you get uh, a menu for that. Uh, that's one place to go. The other one I would go uh, would be the I would go to Deutsche Welle. I would also make sure I read The Economist weekly. Um, uh, Le Monde Diplomatique has, that's the English version, is very good. Um, the Times, that's London Times. Um, Financial Times has a daily coverage of Europe uh, and 
their editorials are pretty good um, in, in coverage. Um, I would go to local English, uh, unless you can uh, read and understand the local languages, the English versions of their major papers, um, and, and BBC for sure. I start my day with BBC. It's a, you know, uh, carryover from my childhood in Cyprus, uh, waking up every morning with my parents listening to BBC. Well, I would also add to this, there's an organization we did a program with maybe six or eight years ago called Watching America. And Watching America translates news from other countries on how the US is being reported globally. So that's mm -hmm. another great place to get a little bit of flipped perspective on our own policies from, a, from, an, you know, from an outside lens. Um, we are down to the wire on our time um, I want to thank people for submitting their questions. Birol, always a pleasure. You're, you know, as you know, one of our one thank of our you. favorite go-tos, and it's nice to see you in your, in the in the comfort and tropical splendor of your of your, of your Without own. Without a tie. <laughs> exactly. Um, and I want to turn things back over to uh, Derek Olson, who is going to uh, take us out into the uh, the brightness of the day. Thank you. So thanks everyone. Again, this is Derek Olson, the president of World Oregon. I want to say thank you for joining us today and for your strong support. Um, as you may have seen uh, with some of our emails, uh, we've really done a, a shift to put everything online, to do virtual, to get more up on our YouTube channel. And we're really trying to uh, be as responsive as we can. To do that, we need your help. So we thank you for those of you who already renewed your membership. If you're uh, able to appreciate a donation or renewing your membership early, um, we're adding on a couple extra months for everybody who renews now, uh, given the fact that we're in virtual setting. So thanks again for your support. Our next upcoming virtual program that we have scheduled is April 16th, From Wheatfields to the World, a conversation with Ambassador Harriet Isom. She's a um, very impressive uh, career foreign service officer uh, who grew up in Pendleton and has journeyed the world. She's our former board chair. Uh, I will be having a Q&A with her and then we'll add in questions from the audience. That's April 16th at noon. Again, free for members, so uh, you can register online. Tim and I are working hard on putting up other programs as well as sharing out uh, links to our partners in the World Affairs Councils of America Network and others that we think would be of interest to you. So keep an eye out for our e-newsletter uh, go to our website, um, and thank you again for your support. Stay healthy, stay engaged, and uh, we will see you at our next event. Bye-bye.